Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Hello and a very good morning and you're welcome to today's signpost webinar. I'm Mark Gibson and I'm joined by Pat Murphy who will be helping us with questions later on this morning. Good morning Pat. Good morning. And today we'll be looking at how uh, Ireland, one of Ireland's largest meat companies, is responding to the sustainability challenge and the trends in beef uh, production and consumption and to tell us all about the ABP sustainability story we're delighted to be joined by Stephen Connolly who's Agri Sustainability Manager for Ireland and Poland with ABP. Stephen, you're welcome to the webinar. I suppose, thank Mark, thanks for, thanks for, thanks for having me. You're very, you're very welcome. And um, maybe Stephen, before we start into your presentation, you could tell us a little bit about uh, your own background and the work you're doing with ABP. Yeah, so I suppose maybe just a bit of my personal background. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a farmer, come from a farming background. And so my role in ABP as an agri sustainability manager is to so build a roadmap for the company to focus on, on agri to reduce our carbon footprint. So what research should we be involved in and how do we get that implemented on farm? Like so it's look, it's very topical at the minute. It's challenging, but something that we're the company are looking forward to. Yeah, it really is a hot topic at the moment. So uh we we do look forward to your insights and and the work that you're doing in ABP and there are plenty of challenges there for sure. So Stephen, we'll hand over to you and uh, we will chat to you after your presentation. Brilliant. Um, so I suppose the title of my topic is ABP's sustainability story, but what I'm really going to focus on is the agri part of that because that has the probably the biggest challenges. And before I go into my slides, I think this picture really, I think it, you know, it really tells the, the beef production story of Ireland and. You have your your cattle, your high quality cattle. They are you know, high quality. They're a grass based system. You've your hedgerows and biodiversity in the background, and you, know, you have that the blue skies and you have the you know, blue water and the sea behind us. And, and this the picture is taken one of our farmers down in Sligo. And I suppose what we really want to do is to how we how do we enhance all those parts of the of the production system and the environment. And this was hopefully throughout the slides, we'll, we'll put some numbers on that and show you how we're going to, going to do that. So what we will talk about, uh, I'm going to give you a little overview of ABP. I'll talk about site sustainability. I'll talk a little bit about agri sustainability and a small bit about our regenerative agriculture um, plans. So a little bit about ABP. So we are one of the largest privately owned agri food businesses in Europe. We were founded in 1954. And we're across nine countries. We've four divisions. So we have our meat divisions in Ireland, UK, and Poland. We have a renewable division uh, called Olico, which I'll talk a little bit about. We have a protein division, and we also have a pet food division, which is CD Pet Food. And we've over 12,000 people employed uh, within ABP. Within Ireland, we have seven processing sites for beef across the country, and we have two lamb sites, which are based in Navan and Camolan. So it's ICM. So just to touch on, I suppose, Olico, which is our renewables division. And some of these might know about, but I think it, it really tells, uh, just shows where, where we are as a company in terms of sustainability. So a bit of history of Olico, I suppose, from humble beginnings, where they would have, uh, I suppose, converted waste animal fat into biofuel um, through innovation, through, um, you know, through growing the business. They now are dealing with 50,000 customers. And then customers are the likes of your fast food chains, um, your pub chains, or your restaurants. And what they do, the, the service they provide is they collect, they use cooking oil, uh, and they convert that into biofuel. And they also collect the, the waste food. Uh, this waste food goes into um, digesters, and it's used to generate green electricity and, uh, and gas. So you know, it really shows us was the, the whole circular economy. Um, and so one example of that is if we take a UK example is um, the McDonald's organic milk supply. Um, these farmers, their milk is collected by Arla, uh, which is processed by Arla in their processing facility. The milk goes to McDonald's and um, we, Olico, will collect the, the use cooking oil and food waste. The food waste will go to our nearby digester uh, which then the energy from uh, from the 
from this food waste is used then to heat the processing plant for Arla. And the digested from the digester is then used to fertilize the, the land and uh, to grow the grass. Uh, and I suppose the next part of that is we're now using the, the slurry from these farms in our digesters. And that is uh, generating compressed biogas uh, to fuel the trucks that's collecting the milk from these, um, from these farms. So I think it's a really good story and it shows how you know, the whole circular economy can work. So site sustainability, and before I go into this, you have three different types of emissions. So you have scope one emissions, two emissions, and three emissions. And so all you need to know from them, is scope one emissions are emissions that are directly, so direct source or site. So it could be, for example, burning fuel to heat water on site. Scope two emissions is emissions from energy. And so the one we're really going to talk on today is scope three emissions. And these are emissions that are, that are basically emissions that are indirect emissions from our supply chain. So for example, our beef cattle are a scope three emission. And they account for approximately 90% of our scope three emissions. So anything we can do to change or improve that will have a massive impact on our business, but also our customers. So what is the ABP 2030 uh, sustainability targets? Okay. So before I go into these, it's important to say these are uh, these are based on, let's say we're in SBTI targets, and they're backed up and accredited by the Carbon Trust. So they're fully verified and independent. So our targets is jump within within uh, within the companies to reduce water by 60%, 40% less energy, uh, less 50% less food waste. 50% less single-use plastic, and we aim to plant 1,000 trees per annum. And if you look there in, uh, on the bottom, you can see that we're, we're well on the way to achieving these. Just gonna throw on a pointer, um, but you can see, look, we're 50% we're have achieved already of less water. We're 1% away of hitting our 40% energy target, and we've overachieved on our, you know, on our single-use plastic. We have more work to do in planting more trees. So we're in a really good place, and I suppose, this is nothing new. We're so as we're we're ten years at this. So, and some of the milestones are um, we were ABP Ellesmere is the first carbon neutral beef processing site in the world. Uh, we've European Water Stewardship and ABP was the first company to be certified under multiple sites. So all our all our sites in Ireland have uh, have uh, European Water Stewardship accreditation, and we're the first company uh, with Carbon Trust to get quadruple Carbon Trust award so for reducing water. Uh, reducing uh, CO2 in our supply chain. So I suppose it just backs up everything that we're, we're doing. And just a small bit on water, I suppose a lot of companies claim that they're, they're water neutral. I suppose ABP is actually a water positive company. So we actually put more water uh, back into you know, the, the, the national, you know, the local streams uh, and rivers than we actually take out because we've such big processing sites and we, you know, we process it, you know, it's, it's all clean, clean water. And we're involved in water quality job catchment uh, projects across uh, across uh, our different sites to try and look at ways even on farm can we improve water quality. Biodiversity again, it's something that's really really important to us, and I suppose we've a, a nurture nature program. And um, within our sites, we have two hundred and fifty thousand square meters of biodiversity corridors. We've planted ten and a half thousand trees. We've twelve and a half thousand plant species. We have two wetland habitats, and we also worked with uh, LIT to develop a study to look at the benefits of corridors to pollinators and other species. We're part of the National Pollinator Plan, and I suppose that's within our factory gate. I suppose the next step for this is what can we do in terms of biodiversity on farm? And we'll touch on that uh, at the, throughout the presentation. Origin Green, we're a founding member of Origin Green. And um, we are part of the Origin Green uh, Voluntary Sustainability Program, um, where we are awarded a gold star uh, standard uh, certificate in 2022, which is the highest possible accolade as part mm -hmm. of the, the, the program. So it just again backs up everything we do. It's verified and independent. They're just some of the awards that we um that we've got through along the years. So next up is agri sustainability. And so this is a little bit more challenging because it's a little bit outside of control, whereas you know, your scope one, your, your scope two is within our factory gates. So as an industry, a beef industry, I think it's important to, to understand where are we now? 
and you know, we are in a good place um, if using the BOR BIA data that's collected uh, through the you know, RS Blast quality assurance uh, program. And we look at the, the carbon data, uh, you know, there's a 9% reduction in fire level carbon emissions from, you know, from 2015 to 2021. Or you can, it's a kilo of CO2 per, uh, per kg of live weight uh, reduction. And if you look at age of slaughter, which is a hot topic at the minute, uh, since 2010, you know, age of slaughter is reduced from 28 months to 26 months. So again, something that's really positive. So we are in a good place, but we have more to do. And again, we export 90% of our beef. And so as we compare ourselves to you know, where are we on, compared to international, and you know, we're one of the most carbon efficient producers of beef in the world. So again, that's, that's hugely important, but I suppose how do we continue to, to have that competitive advantage uh, to, for our customers? We all know this nationally, we have a 25% target to reduce emissions. And so, and again, I think it, I think we can we achieve it or what can we do to achieve it? And look, it is a challenge, but I think we have the tools there to, to hit those targets. So what is the ABP's agri strategy for tackling climate change? So we've two pathways to do this. And so number one is national projects driven by collaboration. We can't do this alone and we need alignment within the industry. So for example, you know, the Chagas Signpost program, something we're very, you know, we're delighted to be involved in at, uh, at an industry level. Uh, we're involved in the MTI, which is called Meat Technology Ireland, uh, which was developed uh, you know, with industry. And uh, in phase one, it looked at very much within the factory gate, looked at meeting quality, but phase two of MTI is looking at suppose, our supply chain and our beef cattle. How do we make them more sustainable? So key pro projects we're working on with uh, the MTI project is the role of genetics to reduce in methane production from our cattle. Um, looking at how to optimize age of slaughter. And we'll touch on the slide on that. Um, we collaborate with Animal Health Ireland, um, ICBF, which is the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation in Chagas, and, and also Borbia. So like, John, we're very lucky to have them organizations. They have the infrastructure, the databases, um, I suppose the, the research and knowledge that I think gives Irish Inc. A, a huge competitive advantage over competitors. I suppose pathway two is which I'm going to talk to you in the next couple of slides is ABP specific solutions to reducing our carbon footprint. And they include um, our demonstration and research farms in Ireland and the UK. We're involved in the Gene Ireland Dairy Beef Programme, which is looking at producing you know, better beef in the dairy herd. We've developed integrated um, beef programs in Ireland called the Advantage Beef Program, Blade Farming in the UK and Horizon in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have a new beef benchmark report that allows our farmers to monitor their carbon footprint versus average farmer and the top 10% of farmers. And we're also involved in a UCD Smart Sport project uh, and we're working on regenerative agriculture. So if I maybe start with our, our trial farms, okay? So first of all, why does ABP have trial farms? And I suppose it's not, these are not new to ABP. Uh, we've began this journey in 2014. And I suppose if we look at the Irish farm, um, the reason we decided to go that route was it was we were on the cup of um, quota abolition. So we knew we were going to get more beef coming from the dairy herd. At that time, there was the beef animals coming from the dairy herd. We have seen that their carcass, I suppose quality or confirmation was reducing because there was selection of beef bulls for dairy herd on easy calving short, short gestation, whereas there was no selection on the beef characteristics. So we really want to understand how is that going to impact our beef farmers? How is that going to impact us as a processor? And how is that going to impact our customers in terms of you know, the quality of the carcass, but also the environmental footprint? So we developed this farm. It's a, it's a 300 acre farm. It's not owned by ABP. It's, a, it's, a, it's owned by a local family. Uh, it's your typical family farm. Um, and I suppose it's not, it's not a model farm, but it's a very functional farm. Um, and what it does is when we bring farmers to that farm, they can relate to it. So it's very similar to our own farms. And they feel, well, if genetics works on that farm, it can work on my farm, okay? But I think that's a really important part and point the difference of this farm. So 
I suppose our mission on the farm is to increase the economic and environmental sustainability of beef production through animal breeding, but also farming practices. So the first key part is, is our genetics. So we're involved in a gene, the Gene Ireland Dairy Beef Programme, which aims to identify the most suitable beef bull genetics for crossing on the dairy herd. So can we identify beef bulls that are easy calving, short gestation for the dairy farmer, good growth rate for the beef farmer, good feed efficiency, good carcass value, and then for our customer, you know, that they have a good eating experience. So that's what we're trying to do, create wins along the, the supply chain. When we identify them, do them suitable genetics, can we improve the main pedigree herd? So the pedigree, is the Angus, Hereford, Limousine, that breed the stock bulls for the dairy herd. So if we can improve the genetics of that herd, we'll have higher genetic merit stock bulls, We'll have more of these genetic and high genetic merit calves. And the last part of it was to understand the role of genetics to the environmental sustainability. How does it impact it? And so just to touch on the other key research areas in the farm, animal health. If you have a healthy animal, the animal performs better, the animal younger at finish, there's a huge sustainability benefit there. So we are proactive to animal health rather than reactive. So that's ensuring these calves come from dairy farms, the calf gets colostrum, but also vaccines are key and having a, you know, a, health, a health plan. We're also looking at animal nutrition, so the use of red clover in our farm to reduce soy usage so that we can have more homegrown protein sources and also reduce our fertilizer usage. Um, soil health and grass management is critical, and we'll talk about that maybe further on in the presentation. We look at biodiversity and water, and we're also looking at what can we learn from organic to bring it to standard farming practices. So how does the Gene Ireland programme work? So ICBF uh, will identify suitable uh, beef bulls for use in the programme. They link with uh, the major AI companies uh, in Ireland. So that can be Progressive Genetics, Monster Bovine, Dove and Eurogene uh, are the four main ones. Semen is distributed out from these bulls and to dairy herds with over 600 farmers involved. Um, and these farmers get a mix of, of different beef bulls uh, to ensure we don't have an impact of cow type. When these calves are, are, when these calves are born, uh, ABP, we purchase 420 calves onto the farm, um, heifers, and, heifers and steers, and we purchase them around three weeks of age. Uh, we buy roughly 20 calves from each bull and we buy the good, the bad and the ugly because we want it to be a representative sample for our trial work and also to be representative of what's out there in the industry. There's an also another roughly 6,000 calves that are born through the programme that are you know, commercially reared by farmers and ICBF collect the data. So on the farm, I suppose what do we do is uh, we rear the animals to heifers at 19 months and steers at 21 months. And the data we collect, so we collect weight data every month, health data, which all goes into ICPF, so we don't keep it to ourselves because it's available for nationally. Um, we then, a proportion of these animals then go for to Tully, which is the National Feed Intake Centre, which measures individual feed intake of cattle and also measures uh, methane emissions. So 150 animals go there. And then when the animals are slaughtered, we'll get the carcass weight data, the confirmation data, and the carcass value. And then of course, these animals get steak samples taken for meat eating quality. So we're trying to get the full picture, you know, the dairy farmer, the beef farmer, but also our customers. So what is the results telling us, which I think is more important? And I'm just going to look within the Angus breed. I'm going to compare progeny from the best performing bull versus progeny for the worst performing bull within the Angus breed. And what we found to date, that we can get 46 kilos more carcass weight at exactly the same age, okay? Which is worth over 200 euros at the minute. So in terms of economic sustainability, that's that box, tick, that box ticked. When we looked at the carbon footprint, there was a 13% reduction. So when we looked at these, these animals from the high genetic merit animal uh, versus the low. So again, so I suppose, it just shows that economic sustainability and environmental sustainability can you know, can go hand in hand and genetics can play a role. And so in terms of a farmer, from a farmer and a purchasing 100 cattle, if I was to purchase cows from the good bull versus the bad bull, just 20,000 there for me as a farmer. 
Okay, so really, really important. Uh, I think it shows the role genetics can play. And just to show the amount of data involved in this, I think is really, really important. So to date, we have 70,000 lightweights from our trial farm, all in ICVF database. We put through over 4,000 animals uh, through the farm to date. We've progeny tested 195 bulls. And to date in Ireland, 385,000 calves have been born from these bulls. So it really shows the scope of the data uh, and it really shows, I suppose, the, show the impact that this research is having show in the country. And I'm just going to show you a short video. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit cringy, but and I hope it works with technology. But it's just something what we do when we bring farmers to the, the farm to show the role you know, the genetics can play. So I really want you when you see this video to just show, show I think you should really highlight it. So. These heifers have been on the farm since they were three weeks of age. They're bred from the dairy herd. And what we want to get out of this video is to show the importance of animal breeding and genetics. So if we take our, our first heifer here, she's by AI Bull uh, Cooler and Patriarch. Um, he has a DBI of 75 euro, but when we look within the DBI, his B sub index is 43. So that will tell me that, you know, what is his progeny going to be like for carcass weight, conformation, fat, and I suppose carcass value. This heifer here is by Steel Picasso. Uh, he has a similar DBI of 68 euro, but when we look at the B sub index of that bull, it's 22. So considerable difference between, I suppose, the genetic merit for, the, for beef between the two sires. And I suppose just to remind people, like for our Advantage Beef Programme, the minimum genetic merit standard for calves being born in 2023 is 35 euro or greater. So calves from this bull here won't qualify for the bonus. This heifer is one week uh, younger than this heifer. And is a trial farm, so they've been treated exactly the same way. So they've got the same, we'll say, rear the same on milk, the same jaw grazing, same farm, and the same finishing. So, I so suppose, first off on the scales um, is uh, the heifer by Cool Rain Patriarch, and you can see she's weighing 634 kilos. Whereas our heifer here by Steel Picasso is 492, so, you know, 140 kilo difference. So when these animals are processed in ABP Slaney uh, in the coming days, we'll be able to see, you know, what is the difference in their in their carcass weight, their conformation, and their uh, I suppose carcass value. So it really should highlight the importance and the role that animal genetics and selecting that right calf can have in a in a profitable and more sustainable uh, dairy beef production system. So following on from a previous video of our two heifers on the ABP demo farm, um, today we're in ABP Slaney where the two heifers now being processed and we're going to talk through how they performed. First carcass here is by the sire Cool Rain Patriarch AA5280 and the second carcass here is by Steel Picasso AA5407. You can see they're similar enough carcass confirmation, they've good confirmation. But when we look at it, this heifer here graded an R, an R equals, and this heifer here graded an R minus. So, you know, still good performance from this animal, but slightly poorer grade. Fat score, which is important, two lovely carcasses. You can see very similar carcass, uh, carcass fat. This heifer here just graded a fat score of four, versus this heifer here, she graded a fat score of a, a three plus, but very little difference. You know, two very suitable in-spec uh, cattle. But then if we look at the big one, what's the difference in carcass weight? The carcass weight of this, this animal here, 355 kilos of carcass weight, versus the carcass weight of this heifer is 267 kilos. So that's 88 kilo difference in carcass weight between the two heifers. So it really highlights when you're buying calves, you need to start asking the question, what is the sire of that calf? Don't just look at the color of the calf alone. So ask about genetics. The new CVV is coming. Start asking about the CVV because it has huge impact in you know, the economics of a dairy beef system. So I so that that video really I think shows the role genetics can play, uh, and that example for economics is a 500 euro difference in carcass value between them two heifers, and in terms of sustainability, so. You know, for an extra week, there was an 88 kilo difference in carcass weight. So, you know, 
huge impact there. So the next part of our research on the farm uh, in collaboration with MTI, Meat Technology Ireland, is uh, capturing methane data. So we have two green feeds uh, on the ABB demo farm. Uh, this is one on the right. And what it's doing is capturing you know, how much methane these animals are producing per day. And what we really want to understand is you know, what is the methane emissions of our cattle at grass across the different, um, the different stages of their life? Um, you know, can we get a full life cycle you know, uh, during you know, grazing, during finishing, during the first winter? Can we identify genetics that can produce lower methane per day? And the other key part of it is ed to educate ourselves how best to use this technology. It's, it's relatively new and it, it probably is not as new on the dairy side, but um, even to manage how to get the animals, to train them to use this equipment to collect the data. So really, really interesting project. And we're delighted to be involved in it with, with Meat Technology Ireland. So I suppose, what is the carbon footprint of our demo farm? Um, and I suppose what you can see there, and this is on a, I suppose, kg a live weight basis are our carbon equivalent uh, but we have a 30 percent lower carbon emissions than the national average um beef, dairy beef system which is really good really carbon efficient it shows genetics and using the best technology can have but it's just one farm and i suppose for abp to make real impact uh, on our supply chain which we close to fifteen thousand suppliers how do we implement some of this research uh, onto, onto more of our suppliers. And one way we're, one way we're doing that is, uh, is through the program called the Advantage Beef Program. It was launched in January, 2022. And really why it was developed was to create an integrated supply chain that can improve efficiency on farm and reduce carbon footprint. It's open to dairy, dairy bred cattle and suckler bred cattle. And what we wanted to do is, you know, can we implement the research findings from you know, the likes of Chagas, from our trial farms, onto some of these farms? And a key part of that is genetics. So how do we get more of these pyrogenetic merit cattle? So we recently began a project with Arivo Co-op, which is a dairy co-op in the west of the country, where we are working together. We give some free semen to dairy farmers. Uh, and them cows were born this spring and they've been purchased by Advantage Bee Farmers. Uh, so they're elite genetics, they've got really good performance, they're healthy calves, they've got the colostrum, and it'll be very interesting to see how that works. And so the other thing we've done within the program is uh, in January we launched a soil sampling service for our farmers. We all know the importance of soil. And so farmers can take, collect the soil sampler at any of our seven sites. Uh, they drop the samples back to ABP. We send them to the lab and they can get a reduced rate of sort of soil sampling uh, with ABP. And I suppose that's one part of it. I so the other part of the program we built into it is the is the Advantage Beef team. So ABP have invested heavily in a farm, farm liaison um, staff, which is something very new, who will work with these farmers. So to try and help them. So for example, if they don't understand how to read the soil sampling reports, the guys can call out. If they want to understand about genetics, uh, we can go out, call out, we can see where, you know, where, which best genetics suits their farm, where can they find these calves. So I suppose this, this team is very, very important to, I suppose, help them to drive down the carbon emissions from, from this supply chain and adding value to our farmers. And they're a group I'm, I'm very proud of. I suppose the second part of the, of the program is, is rewarding farmers for more efficient beef production. And farmers involved in the scheme can get a 20 cent bonus uh, on their cattle, which is worth 60 to 70 euros. So they're getting, I suppose, the benefit of the 60, 70 euro per animal as a bonus. They're also getting the benefit of the farm liaisons. And then if they incorporate genetics, you know, there's potential to add another 100 to 200 euros there. So to get the bonus for a farmer, so his animals must be all of life, uh, S class 4B equality assured, one move in their lifetime, there's a minimum genetic merit standard. Um, so animals from the dairy herd must be from a, a beef uh, sire, a beef sire with a beef sub index in the DBI of greater than 35 euro. There's maximum age limits and they must be part of a national sustainability initiative. I suppose the second part of what we're doing to dry down our carbon footprint is the ABP beef benchmark report. It was developed in collaboration with ABP and ICBF and also Chagas are involved in, in, in the work. 
And I suppose it's a world first. So this report uh, provides carcass of greenhouse gas data on individual animals. So using the animal's genetics, using stage of slaughter, using the production system, we can get a carbon footprint on an individual animal basis. And what it's really about is how can we you know, provide farmers with data that they can make management decisions to improve their job. You know, their profitability, but also their carbon footprint. And today we've given out over 5,000 of these reports to farmers. This is what does the, the report look like? And again, this is just a part of the report. So this farmer here is, uh, slaughtered 132 animals last year. His carbon footprint on a kg of carcass weight was 10.2. The average farmer had a, had a carbon footprint of 12.83 and the top 10% had a figure of 10.56. But this farmer is in the top 5%. So using the right genetics, killing his animals younger, you know, he's, he's doing a really good job. The other part of the report is genetics. So trying to highlight the important role genetics can have to on-farm profitability and sustainability. So recently launched was the Commercial Beef Value Index, which looks to identify the most profitable animals for beef production. And for this farmer, he had it splits his animals in the top third on their genetics and bottom third. So he had 44 animals in each group. And you can see the carcass weight of the top third was 292 kilos and did a carcass confirmation of R minus, which is, uh, which, is, which is good. Whereas the bottom third had a carcass weight of 253 kilos and a carcass confirmation of O plus. <clears throat> so you can see on the same farm, the better genetics was 39 kilos heavier. Again, emphasizing the important role genetics can play. I suppose the last part is farmer communication. And look, we've put a lot of work over the last two years on this. So giving farmers information through the likes of AgriLand, social media, uh, and that video I showed you, uh, we got over 40,000 views on that video. So it shows farmers have an appetite for data and information. We're on, we have webinars, farmer events, our Advantage Farm Liaisons are on farm every day. We've monthly top tips. So every month, farmer gets a text uh, with a landing page on information such as genetics, grassland management, etc. So we need to give the farmers information and build a relationship with them. And so just so this slide is just to show ABP's carbon footprint of our cattle, it's going in the right direction. We're lowering our carbon footprint, but we've more to do. So just the last couple of slides on regenerative agriculture, something that's been talked about a lot, but so there's no real definition. So for ABP, what we mean by regenerative agriculture, it's an end-to-end -end farming system that protects and enhances our natural resources. It's based on the principles of working in harmony with our natural environment. Our approach is to mitigate climate change and support the future of Irish farming families. And we have six key pillars to this. Livestock is the first one. So it's genetics, it's animal welfare of the animal, but also it's the role that livestock play in, we we'll say, other, other foods. So the likes of farmyard manure and slurry, it minimizes uh, fertilized uses on, on crops. But animal plays a huge part. The other uh, is soil health. 95 to 98% of all our food comes from the soil. So we need healthy soil. But if you look at uh, in Europe, uh, at a European level, up to 70% of our soils are in degraded state. So we have lots of work to do. We need healthy soil. Water quality and water usage is really important. So how do we optimize that? Crop diversity. And what I mean by that pillar, it's the use of multi-species swarts, which we'll touch on. Um, it's use of grazing our livestock on potential catch crops, for example, finishing uh, lambs and the benefits that has. Biodiversity is really important. So I suppose on our trial farm in, in Carlo, uh, we have 26% space for nature. And how do we build, I suppose, how do we build, a, I suppose, a roadmap to improve in that biodiversity on, uh, on our, so our suppliers um, and, and you know, hedgerows is really, really important to that. And the last pillar, which I think really should be the center of all of this, is the farmer uh, and farmer education. Because without the farmer, all these other pillars, uh, all these other technologies won't be adopted on farm. So the farmer is so important. So I so suppose to adopt the technology, to be educated, but also to, I suppose, uh, to regenerate the farm. So to develop future farmers, so his sons or daughters that would continue farming on that farm and leave the farm in a, in a state with good soil health. Uh, good biodiversity for the next generation. And the last point of the farmer is farmer safety. We work a lot on our own. It can be, it's a dangerous industry, 
So what can we do to ensure farmer safety? So any farm event we have, farmer safety is key. And if a farmer gets hurt or injured or, or killed, is that farm going to be regenerative? So it's really, really important. So not to touch on, too, not to spend too long on this. This is one project we're involved in. It's the UC Smart Sport project. And what basically it is, is um, cattle are grazed on tea, tree swart types. So you have your typical grass, your perennial rye grass. You have your perennial rye grass and white clover or your multi-species. So your multi-species swart is basically your perennial rye grass is included, some timothy, and your legumes, your red clover and your white clovers, and then you have your herbs. So you've your, your chicory, for example, or your plantain. And I suppose the results from that program is showing that multi-species swarts are growing over two tons more grass than perennial rye grass only, <coughs> with 60% less fertilizer. The cattle are 35 days younger uh, at the same weight. And looking at carbon reductions, there's a 14% reduction between the two systems. So again, it shows you know, the farmer can add value to his system, but also can reduce the carbon footprint. So I suppose the next stage of that is how do we bring it to our trial farms? And how do we bring it to more farmers within our, our production system? So I suppose to conclude, so the ABP and Irish beef production is in a good place. The ABP strategy of sustainability you know, will ensure we meet our targets. Collaboration is key to meet these targets you know, across industry, whether it's across the dairy and beef industry, working with Chagas, ICBF and Borbia, um, and innovation research will get us where we want to where we want to go. And building and maintaining a farm relationship to me is key to meeting our scope three targets. So I so suppose that's all for me. I hope that was a. Uh, I suppose we got some information, and I'll happily take any any questions. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation there, and as I said, that presentation will be available on the Chagas website uh, after today's uh, session. So please do send us your questions using the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen. We have some in already, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, just maybe just looking back there in the last point that you, you made there, uh, Stephen, you said the ABP sustainability strategy will ensure that we meet our sustainability targets. How, how confident are you that uh, we will meet those those sustainability targets? Let's say maybe taking the client, the carbon one for for a moment, the 25% uh, decrease that's required between now and 2030. Um, you know, they're, they're just looking at some of the EPA reports there during the week, and the latest one was published there in April, uh, showing uh, an increase of 3.6% in, in emissions from the, the, the agricultural sector in 2020 to 2021. And... Um, and then during, you know, uh, largely driven by the dairy uh, sector um, and and the use of, of increase of use of nitrogen. But there, there has been a an increase, a very small increase in the non-dairy cattle herd as well. So just maybe just just talk if you could maybe talk us through. Yeah, that look, uh, look. And I think we said earlier uh, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, but I think or, or I heard is where, where this challenge comes opportunity. And mm -hmm. I think we're in a really good place. And I think. Any, I suppose our competitors would love to be in the same situation we're in. First of all, we do have a plan once we know it's reduced by 25%. And I think industry has really rolled in behind and we're pointing in the right direction. So you know, we have the likes of, as I said, we've Borbia, we've Chagas, we've ICBF, and they have the data, the knowledge uh, and the research to back up uh, and put us in the right direction. And, and even if you look at the dairy side and the beef side, you know, we all have similar goals like soda. So I think we're in a good place to, to meet that. I think there's some really good, I suppose, first of all, we need to look at ways to adopt the currently available technologies and get them to be used. And I think future technologies, for example, even the work that was published this week from Chagas and Borbia, or Chagas and ICVF with the, the methane index, you know, showing you know, animals with an 11% difference in their methane output. So like, you know, there's technologies that are not available today that will be available. I think we, are, we will get there. Uh, and look, the likes of the 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 Borbia, you know, the, the Borbia data, the Borbia system. I think, you know, I think we have a good place to to hit our targets. In terms of organic, Stephen, I don't recall you mentioning it during your presentation. Is that something that AIB is engaged, ABP is in, engaged with? Um, and what yeah. what do you see the future prospects there in that that market? 
Yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good question. Like sort of, so yeah, we're one of the largest. Uh, we are the largest uh, chuck processor of organic beef through um, Good Herdsman, and yeah, there's there's massive sca- uh, scope there to increase it. And looking at you know, national policy, government policy to go from seventy five thousand hectares to four hundred and fifty. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it definitely is going to play a role. And I think, look, uh, I know uh, Borbia and, and ourselves are looking at you know, where can we market that beef like sort of so. Definitely, it is going to be, there's huge potential there for beef and lamb. And, and I do think from, a, so as even ourselves is, you know, we can learn from our organic production systems in terms of red clover, in terms of you know, how they feed the cattle. There's definitely, there's pieces we can take from that to bring to conventional as well, which I think is really important. Yeah, I'm sure the question is 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 on its way, but in turn, you know, the, the, there's a huge amount of debate around the you know the the vegan movement and the 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 percentage of meat that's that's uh, in the diet of of Western societies in particular. What what's uh, what's ABP's take on that in terms of the the trends around that and uh, the future prospects? Yeah, look, I think it's a it's a great question. Like so, it is. so yeah, we hear we hear a lot about it. Uh, to be honest with you, but I suppose if you look at the if you look at the data, um. So there is going to be, especially by 2050, so there's going to be more beef, uh, there's going to be more meat, beef eaten. So there is going to be more markets. Maybe people will eat a little bit less, but some other you know, poorer countries will potentially be able to afford that. So to me, there's going to be more. I think it's all about balance, Mark. You know, you need a, it's like a, you need a balanced diet. Uh, so and meat or beef will play a part in that. Like, so it is because... Um, John, that's where John and it feeds into John's a very healthy product, so everything in moderation, in my opinion. So, I I, I don't say that we've been heard, heard that for so long now, but I don't think John beef will be will be will be eaten, it's part of a, a healthy, balanced diet. And also, John, uh, dairy and beef, John, it does feed into other other John, food products, such as John, your bread that you eat, like or your you had your cereal this morning, you know, the, the farmyard manure, the John fertilizes them crops and if you look at the green deal they're targeting 20 percent less fertilizer in europe without animals we're going to supply more fertilizer so i think it's all a balance that'd be my my view like i think that's you know common sense will prevail that there's some uh really good questions coming through from from our, our uh, absolutely viewers. the first one in the uh, first question i have in instances a, a, a a development in the Boyne Valley of a, a plan seeking planning permission where there's going to be water going into the river. But the question is, what methods do the company apply, employ uh, to uh, effectively clean or, or improve the quality of the water before it's discharged into local rivers? Yeah, so look, and it's look, I suppose it's important to say that that is an area I'm on the I'm on the agri side. But as you can see, basically on our, our accreditations you know, and our awards, uh, we would be leaders in that. Uh, all our water is treated, uh, and in true regulation, governmental regulation is monitored. So, you know, that is something that you know, we, you know, there is no, we're a hundred percent on a company on that. Like, so we have to meet that standard, and so we go above and beyond. Um, so, so that's how that's what we do. Like, so, so again, we're monitored you know, for true regulation, and also we monitor ourselves, like, to be to ensure that doesn't happen. So a couple of questions in relation to the the beef sub index uh, and and uh, and the the bonus there, and also uh, I, I suppose a question around that as well in relation to if you're getting if you're using that, how is that balanced with uh, the I suppose the old standard for for dairy farmers of making sure that they were easy calving and short gestation? Yeah, so a, a good question. So look. So the, the DBI, which is the, the dairy beef index, which is used to, to select suitable bulls. So um, I suppose the key part of that index is it has a calving and a gestation part, which is roughly 40% of it, and then 60% is beef. So I suppose what I would say to any farmer, everyone has different levels of comfortable, comfortable of what calving difficulty means to them. So what I would say, using the index, you select what calving difficulty is suitable for yourself. And then you select the best beef bull possible for that. So the bulls with the best beef sub index, but also with the best carcass weight. And what we've seen, uh, what we've seen, take for example, I was looking at a bull the other day. There was two bulls uh, on the on the farm, Fajim two bulls, uh, two Herefords. Um, 
but one bull had a calving difficulty of 3.1%, uh, okay? The other bull had a calving difficulty of 3.4%, but we looked at their beef characteristics. Uh, one bull had a carcass with a minus for carcass weight, and the other bull had a, had a carcass weight of 16 kilos. That was within a breed. So you can get bulls, Pat, that are, you know, that are ca easy calving, short gestation, but with good beef traits, and they are out there. And that's what we, you know, we don't want any hard calving or anything like that because you know, dairy farmers are busy, the welfare side of things, but there's bulls available that are balanced and, and the DBI does do that. So, um, But it's important to look within the sub-indexes. Don't just look at the DBI figure, look within that, the B sub-index and the carcass. Okay, and, and I suppose that there's some uh, questions there and you, you alluded to it. Uh, I suppose the relationships between the dairy sector and the beef sector in, in terms of uh, supplying a high quality uh, calf that's going to allow profitability into the, the, the beef sector. How do you see that relationship emerging? And I think you, you talked about the CBV as being maybe a key element to that. And there was a, a question yeah. there asking for an explanation of what CBV is. So two questions. In yeah, one so yeah, so the I might start with what is the CBV. So it's it's called the commercial beef value, and it's a it's an index that's recently been developed. And basically, what it is is when when a calf is born, he gets the CBV. So it's it's basically its potential or it's it's how profitable that animal is for beef production. So it includes uh, it includes Joe's you know, carcass weight, genetic merit, his merit, his genetic merit for feed intake. Uh, it includes then also age at slaughter. So all that data feeds into it. So basically what it is, is the DBI, when you strip out calving different gestation, because the calf is born now, so you don't have to worry about it. So it is, it's going to be the future, and it's going to be how calves are traded, whether from the suckler herd or, or the dairy side. Um, but I suppose, again, it's back to future technologies, and, and it, so it's another way we're going to reach our carbon, uh, our carbon targets um, with national genotyping. And I think that is potentially on the cards for Ireland. I think that will make that index more available to farmers and it will give that bit of comfort that you know the animal's genotyped and he's from the sire that you know, that you that you're buying from like so it gives that bit of credibility to the index so that will be the that will be the future in in my view like so it is so um and it look it's all about i suppose when i talk about building relationships between dairy and beef farmers for so long now we've one one group is here the other group is here we all need to work together okay and I suppose what we are doing on that is we're what we're doing is we're linking dairy farmers with beef farmers. So we're working with the AI companies that have beef farmers that have used these good genetics, that they have a good cow type, cow type that they're farmers with good facilities, the calf gets colostrum, and we're linking them, we're linking farmers this spring with beef farmers within our advantage program that want to work together. So again, it can't be just all about price, also, Pat, Joe, that you need to build that Joe, so there's a people element to it. That, both farmers get on with each other, that obviously it's a fair price. And for example, the beef farmer, if he says he comes at two weeks or three weeks to collect the calf, he does come like. So that's where it needs to get to. Because what we really need to get to, again, to hit our targets, is before the breeding season starts, the beef farmer and the dairy farmer sit down together to select a team of beef bulls to use on that dairy herd. Then they agree, you know, they will buy all their calves or proportion their calves at X age, at X price. And then we step in, Joe, you know, that we then well, look, we'll process them animals through advanced beef program at X age. Like so, so more integration is, is key to you know, to so strip out costs in the system and add value, but also reduce the carbon footprint. Like so it is. Okay. So a, a, a question there in uh, in relation to bonuses. How much uh, of a bonus do farmers supplying uh, beef to ABP received for sustainability measures, and and does Stephen believe such a bonus is enough? And has a ABP any plans to further incentivize uh, farmers to uh, uh, adapt environmental uh, sustainable uh, measures? Yeah, so another another question. So if we look at the advanced beef program, that's your voice or your sound has gone funny there, on us, Stephen. Can you hear me any better now? No, the, it's gone a bit crackly on us. Um, 
Maybe. I promise that's not to do with trying to get into there. <laughs> Avoiding the question. I, I promise that that's not the case. So let's uh, do that. If you turn off and turn on your microphone again there, maybe, Stephen, just does that make any difference at all? I think I'm now. Uh, no, it's still gone very. No, no improvement, I'm afraid, there, Stephen. Unless now, um, what you can do is log in and log, log out and log in again. I know it's a bit drastic, but uh, we're coming close to the end. Yeah. There are a few more questions. Uh, that, uh, no, I'm afraid it's okay. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, that's a that's a pity now. Whatever, I must, I must, uh, might get a couple of coming up things there, Mark. Uh, so, yes, indeed. Yeah, so, um, good, good opportunity to, to let everybody know that next week our colleagues in the agricultural catchments program are going to be running uh, an intensive campaign to highlight all of the, the activities that are taking place within the agricultural catchments uh, program. Uh, so do keep an eye out for all of the uh, the work that's going on there in the social through social media and website. Uh, Can you hear me any better now? Yeah, Mark? that's that's perfect, there, Stephen. Um, just just uh, highlighting Stephen a few things that are happening next week that we're we're going to be joined next week by our colleagues uh, also on the the signpost webinar. Uh, per Eric Melander and uh, Jason uh, Galloway are going to be talking about some of the the water quality trends taken uh, observed from the agricultural catchments program. So really interesting work that they're doing there. So Stephen. Uh, Conveniently, your line started <laughs> to break down during the. So I just want to. <laughs> the, the tougher <laughs> questions were getting. The, the questions were getting tougher there. So. Um, I, but, I uh, promise that that wasn't intentional, though, Pat. So it was like, <laughs> I promise you that. So, was, uh, so yeah. So your question was about paying and sustainability bonuses, um, and and what way that looks like. So I suppose if we just touch on the Advantage B program, where we are paying a sustainability bonus of twenty cent a kilo, which is worth sixty to seventy euros an annual. That is a bespoke uh, program, okay, because it involves genetics and and show all what we're doing. But I suppose if you look at it, I suppose the national level, it's something that us personally we haven't we haven't looked at. But uh, I suppose at an industry level, you know, we will be behind, you know, whatever we think is the right thing to do to help as an industry, you know, uh, to meet our targets. And so the other side I would put to that is, you know, we're we've heavily invested in researching whether it be our trial farms or whether it be, you know. In national projects you know, to help as was aid efficiencies on farm and i really do feel you know, that you can add huge value in terms of for example the role of genetics by buying them right calves just as 100 to 200 euros there to be got like so uh, i think you know working on that side of things if you can judge you know, the likes of the you know, use of clover and again add value and reduce cost like so that so so that's where that's where i'd, I'd answer that for. Okay, and, and I suppose a, a second question there, uh, talking about a, ABP benefits from new markets and international customers, one for his beef on the back of sustainability, uh, but does, do you believe that farmers are actually seeing a benefit in terms of the price they're getting for their, their product and the reputation it has vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, I suppose, international competition? Yeah, again, another another great question. I suppose, look, it's important to highlight we export 90% of our beef, okay? Um, so anything that we can do to give us that competitive advantage um, I will have a benefit to our beef farmers. And in terms of sustainability, uh, I think that that does give us that competitive advantage to to get into that space. And like it is a very competitive market. Like So... It has, I would say, it has had a huge, a huge advantage to us getting into markets and uh, and staying in them markets that don't you know, that they choose Irish beef over other parts of the world, like so. It is. So, look, and it does open their markets. So, I'd say we are benefiting from that. Uh, and I do think, in where it's all going, uh, with the infrastructure we have, we need to promote that and highlight what we're doing uh, and really show that you know, currently we're very carbon efficient and what we're going to do into the future. Um, job is going to make us even more and make us, I suppose, be ahead of the rest. Mm. A, a question there in relation to uh, emerging technology in the feed additive uh, space is this something you've looked at? And from a market perspective, uh, it has huge capability to reduce methane, but uh, from the perspective of uh, acceptability, acceptability to the consumer, what's what do you think this, the space we're in in that regard? Yeah, uh, and again, look, 
really positive results. Like for example, John Bovere dropped 25, 30%. My my own personal view is that uh, I suppose it's probably going to be the, the cherry on the cake. Um, I suppose we're we having it available for beef, yeah. Uh, I think we need to we need to try and get implement some of the the readily available technologies that we have currently, whether it be genetics, um, and get that right. And even someone said to me uh, the other day, uh, probably our best additive uh, that we could use that's available is high quality grass. Uh, and Joe, the the research in Chagas and Moor Park showing uh, Joe the methane reductions from high quality grass uh, Joe can be can be as important as as any feed additive, but um, from a cluster point of view, I don't see any issue there with using, using these ad- additive uh, paths. So they're, um, so it's a tight reg- tightly regulated industry, like so, and there's no impact there. Um, but so the big challenge there would be how do you verify that you know animals got you know, have got that product? Uh, and a lot of the products at the minute, so it's only available so, to uh, so a TMR. So that I suppose a lot of our cattle are finished off grass. How do you get it all all year round? So it will play a part. But we're probably just a few years out yet to, to have a real real impact. Stephen, you a mentioned about the, there. Uh, uh, sorry, about, uh, oh. I, I was just going to ask Stephen there about right. the max age limits that you mentioned in the presentation. Um, what what sort of age limits are you looking at, or what's the targets there? Yeah, and uh, so look, I suppose first of all, we have lots of different farming systems. So we have a, a very important suckler beef system, and then we have dairy calf to beef, and I suppose. There are, on farms are different land types uh, and also the animal are different. So what we said for a suckler bred steer is a 28 month system. OK, and for your dairy bred steer is a 26 month system. For your dairy bred heifer is under 24 and your suckler bred heifer is under 26. OK, so that's I suppose that's why. And the reason why we did that is if you look at the Chagas Grange research, they're showing that a 28 month uh, you know, steer on a grass-based system can be as carbon efficient. So I suppose it's to get that balance there. Like so it's and look, a lot of our cattle are born in the spring, so we need a spread and supply. But if we can bring maybe our 30 month cattle to 28, you know, it's all about trying to make little incremental gains, uh, job irrespective of what farming system that that you're in, like so. So I think that's really important. No one size fits all. It's just, a, I suppose, a, a final uh, uh, question. I think maybe sums up some of the t- the information or some of the stuff you were talking about on breeding. I have a, a full genomic tested dairy herd, uh, full DNA uh, registration of calves, all AI stock and no stock, uh, all AI and no stock bull. I've I've seen no financial return when selling calves versus standard calves via mark sales. Uh, it's hard to justify the investment, but I suppose. You were alluding to changes coming about there. Uh, do you see that that farmer being uh, uh, advantaged in the future from the efforts he's put, he's put in? Yeah, no, great, great question. If you want him to pass on his name and his details, I'm sure we'll we'll find a home for his calves if they're if they're that high genetic merit. So, look, that man is doing everything right, or or woman like sort of. So, I suppose I suppose traditionally cows are bought on looks alone. So, if a farmer was you know doing uh, trying to use these better genetics you mightn't see that potential at two to three weeks of age because they're being bought on looks whereas on the dairy side you're buying ebi so you know that's so that's when you're buying your replacement heifers on ebi because you know, we know it works on the b side we're more on the looks of the animal that is going to change uh, and with you know i think national genotyp- genotyping uh, that these animals will be traded under cbv there will be you know, there will be i think uh well, there'll be change in the market how these calves and, are paid and for. A financial bonus for them, for example. <laughs> uh, we, we won't go there. Um, but I suppose the other the other part of it is like I suppose the information wasn't there on mark boards, so as where now it is. But I think if you can build a relationship with the, with the beef farmer, I think that that understands it because what we found the example of them two heifers, the big difference was eighty eight kilos of carcass va- a weight difference and five hundred euro. There was only twenty euro difference in the calf price. Hmm. so again it's about building the relationship and that's what we're trying to do like that again that again it can't all be about money that you know, that this animal is worth 100 euros more but i suppose from a dairy farmer especially with the changes of what's coming that if your calves are more marketable than the neighbor down the road you know that calf is going to leave your farm earlier that farm beef farmer if he's making money is going to come back again next year to have repeat customers and again in terms of stress and everything to know where your calves are going 
Joe, again, that all fits into sustainability that my B calves are going to Joe Blogs, he'd come back every year, they're being okay. killed younger. So that's that's really, really important. Okay, Stephen, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. We're just a little over time. Thank you so much for uh, today's presentation and uh, answering all the, the questions. Uh, and um, we we and thanks Pat for for helping out with the questions as well because uh, there's some some uh, a lot of lot of really good questions coming through from from our viewers today. I appreciate uh, the views today. We we um, it is a busy time in the calendar for advisors around the country, so um, we, we still see a lot of lot of people dialing in this morning. So do join us next uh, Friday for uh, the Signpost webinar, which is going to be looking at water quality, and we have two of our. Uh, scientists from the uh, agricultural catchments program are going to be speaking about water quality trends and uh, the work that they're doing in that whole space and do keep an eye out for the the, the media campaign that they're going to be running next week as well uh, all throughout uh, uh, next week and I uh, want to wish you all a lovely long weekend you've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.